Welcome back to the final episode of the Matchbook Cheltenham Trail. I'm your host, Daniel Hussey. Delighted to welcome, for the last time, Matt Toombs and Don McLean. Don, busy week at Cheltenham, a lot happening. Um, but people like to know, profitable-wise, how did you get on? Go through the four days for us, and uh, was it ultimately a, a profitable one for you? Yeah, um, struggled the first two days, Dan, when um, when Winnie Mullins, all, the, all those good things that Winnie Mullins are winning, I'm struggling. Um, better the last two days, but... No, if if um if Majbra hadn't won the time hurdle, it would have been a it would have been a very very tricky week. So Majbra was a was a was a was a he was um the shining light in my week. But no, like I I got a few things wrong. Like Slade Steele, I thought he was going for the Ballymore. I didn't. I ended up not backing Tiapu in the end. Um, didn't back Limerick Lace, and yeah, onto, you know a few crossbars. But yeah, an, an enjoyable week, but not a hugely profitable one. Shout out to you on our Cheltenham preview night. Your best bet of the week was Majbra. So that's a long way to go, Don, particularly with that drift, which we'll get into. Uh, Matt, take it away with your uh, Tuesday to Friday. Yeah, I had a bit of luck, particularly in the, the early part of the week. I, I had a um, filthy each way anti post player and Captain Guinness, because I'm, I'm absolutely shameless, and, and that fell in. Uh, and also one or two each way bets that just scraped into the places at big prices when they could have been edged out and it would have been a very different story um and a, a good uh second half to the week um stella story who will will come on to better days ahead great dawning so um yeah lucky week and uh, the week definitely got better uh racing wise as it went on which was good okay and um, for fun final time to this week we're going to do a complete chat and review show there's a couple of horses the guys have on the shortlist for Aintree and punchestown and if you divulge us for maybe a couple of minutes at the end, we will take a look and have a short list on a couple of 2025 Cheltenham horses to keep an eye on. You've seen how hard it is to bet Andy Post this year. So um, we're just giving you guys a couple of ideas to maybe take into the summer. But um, Matt, we'll start with Slade Steel and the Supreme. I mean, he was the talk of the Cheltenham Trail. I, I was chasing his price all the way to maybe five or six to one, but uh, I got some money down eventually. But he was a very impressive winner. I thought he was beaten after the last. Yeah, well done. He, he was stamina won the case for him, didn't it? Uh, very testing ground. If you can believe the official times back in the day, winning times more than five and a half seconds slower than any Supreme this century, despite them to looking to run pretty efficiently. That really suited him. Yeah, he's a thoroughly likable sort. Uh, he jumps, he gallops. He looked like he was going to get beaten when Mystical Power went past him at the last. Um, but he's got lots of stamina. And you'd imagine being with Henry de Bromhead as a chasing prospect. Henry's horses tend to improve more than most for the switch defences. He looks a cracking prospect. Um, Firefox, a bit disappointing. He was the one I backed, I backed him anti-post. Uh, didn't get a clear run, but even so, he just didn't have the acceleration he showed against Ballyburn, uh, running on when the race was over. Though it wasn't officially changed to heavy until after the arc, it was obviously heavy ground. Perhaps that didn't suit him. He was on the easy list after Nace, so maybe he'll come on for this, uh, albeit Gordon's often aren't at their peak at Punchestown. And that's going to be a, a key theme for analysing this year's festival. You're always looking for horses where there was a valid excuse not factored into their price next time. Extreme ground will be a key one this year. Tell other names one I'd have on the list. Uh, he'd been really good twice on the sound surface, disappointing twice on soft. Ben Pauling looks to have the best crop of novice herders in Britain, and he was really sweet on him. So I'll give him a pass for that. Um, and one who might go a bit more under the radar is Favour and Fortune. Alan King had said all season he'd be a different proposition on spring ground. Uh, he blundered at the first, never got into a rhythm, but finished well to be beaten uh, less than 10 lengths. He's one that could be underestimated for uh, maybe the top novices or the mercy at Aintree. Yeah, Don, you were chasing Slade Steele's price for the Ballymore throughout the season, so uh, I presume there was no no save around him in the Supreme, unfortunately. No, I, look, of course I should have backed him with the Supreme. Um, I didn't, uh, but lucky showed that he had the pace for two miles, and I'm sure the Ballyburn presence in the Gallagher that uh, influenced connections decisions to run in here, or maybe it was the sole in, in, in influencer. But Rachel Blackmore did say after the Leopardstown race over two miles that he, you know, it was the first time that she thought he had two mile pace that he was he was fast enough for two miles and sharp enough over his hurdles, and no, he he was he was very good. And like when he got in tight to the final flight, he lost ground on Mystical Power. Mystical Power headed him. But for me, that was a, a really likable part of it, the way that he battled on and the way that he picked up and went up the hill. And he didn't just get up and beat Mystical Power by a neck. He went he went on and surged past him and went, went and won by a length and a half. 
um, and he was a wee bit keen through the early part of the race as well. So he's really interesting for, you know, it looks to be another hurdle in the bag, brilliant. But for next season going forward, I'm sure he'll go over fences. Um, that's Henry de Ronghead's way. And Brian Atchison of Rob Corr said afterwards as well, he seemed to be thinking that, you know, he's not going to beat some of those horses in, who are in the champion hurdle picture. So go over fences and he could improve again going over fences. I suppose the trip is a thing with him. He could go out and trip, but he might also have the pace to be an Arco horse for next season. So, yeah, like I, I, I think he's a he's a really interesting horse for obviously for next season. Look, looking ahead to to going over fences. Yeah, great race I thought, great way to open the festival and Gaelic Warrior. Uh, Matt, Matt, we'll go back to you. He took us all by surprise. Um, I don't think any of us had him. Uh, I just thought that that tight course in less than two miles, the lot amount of turning. I just thought uh, it would eventually catch up with him, but he was absolutely superb. He was, and it's the classic thing, wasn't it? Everything was against him. But he was by far the best horse in the race on all known forms. If that had been a right-handed track, you'd have he'd have been odds on. So and he managed to cope with it. Um, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed watching him. I really hope he goes the right way after this because it'd be brilliant to see him in the champion chase next year. It does look like Willie's got his eye on the Ryanair, unfortunately, depending on what else he has at the time. Um, some interesting horses in behind. A founder fifty looked in the wrong race, just didn't have the speed to go with the winner. Um, he's not a two miler, but I think he has the potential to be an open grade one horse, two and a half, maybe three miles. Um, be interesting to see which way they go with him now. Ilite Tom, small, um, having jumped the stiffer leopards down fences well last time, made mistakes here. Uh, perhaps he struggled jumping out of the bad ground, hasn't shone in three attempts at the festival, but might be a different proposition at Punches Town. And the others were well beaten off. The start was important here. Hunter's Yarn looked to get himself in a st uh, state down at the start. So perhaps he can be forgiven for this. Though Daryl Jacob said afterwards he may want to step up in trip. He might not be as good as I hoped he would be. And Quilixios missed the start. Was hampered by authorised speeds. Fall at the second. Um, used energy getting back into contention and folded tamely. I I'd forgive him that. I to me, he doesn't shape like a two-miler. I think intermediate distances are suited well. But I think you can forgive him this. So there are one or two of these who might bounce back at punches down. But Gaelic Warrior was brilliant. Yeah, Don, the, the hood seemed to have a, a massive effect. He just jumped straight throughout and also being able to take a lead as well. Yeah, I think that probably helped him. Was right, Dan, uh, the hood obviously did. And look, he was on his toes in the parade ring beforehand, but that's his way. He's always on his toes. You'd be a bit worried if he wasn't on his toes. And and he wasn't, wasn't overly exuberant in the in the preliminary, so he was fine. And then once he got down to the start, he was fine. Um, I, you know, like he... I was against him. I thought he'd go way more to his right than he did, but he he was a little bit to his right. But he was, you know, for Gaelic Warrior, he was very very straight and he beat himself. I the the matter with Gaelic Warrior is whether you know we just don't know from from race to race how he's going to be in the preliminaries or uh, in terms of temperament how it's going to affect him. But go to Cheltenham and for, for an arc on all the hullabaloo that goes around that, he coped with it really well. Um. I thought Ilete Tont did well to finish third. He, he really didn't jump well. And as Matt says, it probably was because of the ground. And as we discussed beforehand, he's never been at his, at his best at Cheltenham. He, he, was, he underperformed the time hurdle, under, underperformed the Supreme Novices hurdle, and probably underperformed here as well for all that his jumping didn't help. But he, he stayed on really well to finish third. And yeah, look, maybe punches down on better ground, but he's never really, from Cheltenham, he's never really performed at Punchestown either. He hasn't taken a step forward from Cheltenham to Punchestown in the past. So maybe he's a horse for next season back to Leopardstown. I know it's a, it's a long way away. We have a whole flat season to get through between now and then. But back to Leopardstown for Christmas or for the Dublin Racing Festival, where he excels, please God, then he's a horse to keep in mind. But look, he's 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 kind of smallish for jumping fences and the ground, I'm sure, didn't help him in that regard. But he's, he is a good jumper of fences and he, set, he settles better over fences than he did over hurdles. So he, I'd say, look, he's only six. So I'd say he's still a horse to keep in mind. Um, if not for points stand, then for next season going going into open grade. Okay, yeah, and in the interest of time, we'll be quick enough on State Man Don, but um, he was brilliant, brilliant. I think Willie Mullins' first win in the race since Andy Power was a super sub back in 2016. Yeah, yeah, I know he he was good. Look, it was there for him in the absolute Constitution Hill. He had to go and do it. It's good that he's got a champion hurdle win on the board. He wasn't overly impressive in winning. But he did it well. And I think Paul Tannen probably rode him to beat Irish Point and beat him for speed. They didn't go a great pace early on. I think the, the finishing speed percent was 108% or thereabouts. So it probably wasn't a race that was set up for a performance that was going to blow you away. And it wasn't a performance that would blow you away. But he, he, he got it done. You never really thought at any point in the race that he wasn't going to win. He's, he's that just 
uncomplicated, straightforward horse. Paul Tennant can put him wherever he wants in, in the race, including in front, and he just seems to settle wherever he is and wait for his, his rider's uh, instructions when to pick up, and he did. He picked up well. He had speed at Irish Point, and I think Irish Point, you know, he's a, he's a he probably just lacks the pace for championship two-mile, as in champion hurdle race, but he only went down by just under, or just over a length in the end, and I mean, look, he's a horse who you definitely have in mind for entry for the entry hurdle, two and a half miles back at entry where he won the Mersey hurdle over course of course and distance last season. The complication is Bob Ollinger, that's it, that's been his target for a long way away. And Bob Ollinger trained by Henry de Bromhead, but he's also like Irish Point, trained by Gordon Elliott, owned by Rob Corr. So, but look, you know, it's, it's the right race for both horses. So maybe they wouldn't be averse to allowing, allowing the two of them to go there. But Irish Point, he's, he's definitely a, an improving horse. Um, he seems to be very versatile. He's won a grade one over three miles. It's proven here that he had two mile pace for champion hurdle and he pulled clear of the rest. So um yeah, he's, he's a horse you definitely have to be on your list for entry. Yeah, I think the latest on that is there's talk that maybe Irish Point might go to Liverpool hurdle over three miles done. So again, there's talk of separating the horses and see where the cards fall. But I agree, Irish Point probably definitely suited to that two and a half trip. It's just a pity Bob Ollinger is in there as well. Matt, take maybe Lozzie Mout in this uh, as well as State Man. And look, we were denied ultimately the clash of the two. I don't think it was ever likely throughout the season. But, um, you know, Mayor's program and Champion Hurdle program, it, it means ultimately these races are separated. Even if there are changes to the program, I feel these horses will somehow be always be able to avoid each other. So what, what's your sort of take on the races themselves and how we can maybe try and get as more and more clashes at the Channel Festival? Well, I, I don't think if you, we change the programme, the horses will avoid each other. Um, I think if you look at the DRF, Willie runs all his horses, even though there are only uh, two novice chases, two novice hurdles. So I, I think if you did change, say, the mayor's race to keep out the very highly rated mayors, they would run in the championship races. I think if you got rid of the turners and made that back into, say, the old novice handicap chase, which was a great race festival, very competitive, lots of small, medium size yards won it so it was a, a realistic target for those types of trainers um i don't think you would lose any of the horses virtually none of them um the mayor's hurdle itself it was they went very slowly finishing speed was 108 percent quite why they allowed that to happen when on some of the stayers when lossy mouth was clearly the fastest mare in the race is a bit of a mystery but she was excellent with the, the test uh, they gave her um and it's impossible to know how she would have got on in the champion hurdle. A lot of five-year-olds like Binocular, Punjabi, were beaten at five, came back and won at six. Um, she would have certainly made the champion hurdle a much more exciting race. But as you said, Daniel, if you've got the other races, uh, the mega connections are going to split their horses up. Um, hopefully, she will go down the honeysuckle route and go for the champion hurdle uh, next year. And that will definitely make it a more interesting race than it was this year. Yeah, and on that team, maybe next year's champion hurdle, Don, we bring it to Bally Burn. He looks like a champion hurdle or in waiting. It's just not even a case of Willie Mullins necessarily. It's a case of the strength of the champion hurdle division if you take Stayman, Lossie Mount, Constitution Hill. So what are your thoughts on Bally Burn's performances and where he could perhaps go next year? Well, Bally Burn did what everybody expected Bally Burn to do, as in whatever race he runs and he goes and wins it, and he wins it well. And, uh, yeah, look, he, he was serious. You know, like the, the expectation going into the race about him was really high, but I think he lived up to it. Like, he, he was so good. Um, I actually watched the race from just before the final flight, and that was just for Paul Town and asked him to pick up. And he, he just surged forward, went away from Jimmy. Jimmy Desoy ran a massive race in second. Um Thing the last and line, like Atlantic made that mistake at the final flight, but uh, it might have been the difference between finishing second and finishing third. But no, Ballyburn, he, he was brilliant. Um, and you know, you have to think if he'd have run the Supreme, he'd have done something similar. So, look, who knows where you're kind of thinking he's a he's a he's a chaser in waiting, like he's a point to point winner, and his pedigree tells you that he's a staying chaser in waiting, but. Willie Mullins has been talking about the dog, the Don Run achievement, and his dad is the last trainer to achieve that with Don Run. Obviously, um, it'd, it'd be great if he could go and, and try it. It's kind of like uh, trying to go for the Triple Crown. In order to win a Triple Crown, you need to win the Guineas first. In order to win the Champion Hurdle and the Gold Cup, you need to win the Champion Hurdle first. So while he's a he's a chaser in waiting, he's six, he'll be seven now next year. Please God, um, if he could pick up a champion hurdle on the way to being a staying chaser, that would be uh, that would be you know it would be some achievement. It would be another kind of Willie Mullins milestone. Um, 
but yeah, look, he's, he, you know, he, and, and William Bullen's having the first five in the race as well. Another expression of his dominance throughout the week. But look, Ballyburn, I suppose we, we have to wait and see. We didn't know until the day before the race where he was going this year. So how are we going to know where he's going to go next year at this stage, a year out? But no, look, he's, he's just a really exciting horse and he did all that was, he was expected to do. Yeah, Matt, quick line on Ballyburn. Uh, brilliant horse. And it's very unusual that the top novice hurdlers have taken each other on in very narrow form lines. He beat Slade Steele. Um, uh, Absurd was in that race. And then Slade Steele had beaten the Albert Bartler winner, Stella Story, and the Martin Pike winner, Better Days Ed, and the Navan hurdle. So that shows you that Ballyburn really is head and shoulders above these. This was a really weak race. You know, he's uh, beaten a 67.0 shot who uh, recorded ratings of 123 and 126 in his two hurdle starts, 13 lengths. So I wouldn't be giving him a stellar rating for this. He did what he had to do because he's a top-class novice. Uh, but his form at the Dublin Racing Festival was much better than this. Uh, he's hugely exciting, it goes without saying. My hunch is he's more likely to go over fences next year. But that will depend on what else Willie has. And punch us down, um, particularly with some of Willie's novice hurdlers who are chasing types who uh, haven't been to Cheltenham might give a few more clues to that. So he was really, really good, but I don't think you can rate this form particularly highly. Okay, moving on to another exciting Willie Mullins horse, novice chaser. Fact to file, Matt, take away your thoughts on this race. I thought it was a pretty decent rate. Monty Starr ran very well for a long while, but uh, fact to file was just too good. Yeah, I thought they were both very good. I mean, there were only six runners. Stay away, face, scope bad. The American Mike's jumping in past master. So it did fall apart a bit. Fact to file was good. A uh, bit free early on, again, mid-race. I wasn't as keen as I feared he would be going the steady gallop. Jumped a bit to his right again. Um, wasn't foot perfect, but never looked like being beaten. But he didn't go away as you hoped he might on the run-in if he was a superstar. Beat Monty Star by less than four lengths. That didn't scream to me that he was crying out for the Gold Cup trip. But we have that question mark with most second season chasers going into a Gold Cup. I wouldn't say he isn't going to get it, but it didn't scream out that he definitely would. Um, if he settles better with the experience, that would obviously help him. Uh, stronger run race, better ground may suit him. He's got to be trained as a Gold Cup horse now, but 5.0 makes zero appeal against uh, Gallup and Deschamps and co. And though he'd run over hurdles, Monty Starr was the one I thought had more improvement in him longer term. Very raw and backward last season. Unlike Factifile, no grade one chase experience, arriving here just off a couple of beginners chases. Half-brother to Mona Lee, who's beaten a couple of lengths in the Gold Cup. I could see the natural improvement you'd expect, giving his inexperience, being enhanced by going up in distance. So 21.0 about him's more appealing. Um, Giovinco vindicated connections, confidence in him. He ran really well, beaten just over six lengths, having been out the back much of the way. Uh, he was ridden cold to switch off and learn, so he can probably be marked up a little for that. He's up two pounds to 148, so that looks a good mark to target a race like the Coral Gold Cup next season, the old Hennessy. And finally, Sandor again, when he started backing off his fences, as he'd been doing, and I didn't think he'd get round, but his jumping did warm up. Um, he was beaten 10 lengths here. It does leave a bit of a question mark over the form. He'd run well in the Albert Bartlett last year. Maybe he's a spring horse, but he didn't look to have taken defences. So I'm open-minded about how this race is going to work out. Um, he's still a maiden over fences. So if he can improve and have more of a cut at his fences, he might be one for the National Hunt Chase next season. OK, yeah, Don, your thoughts? Yeah, um, it, it was an interesting race because fact to file, as Matt said, he, like he, he didn't jump well early on. He was kind of a bit to his right. He wasn't very fluent. He was kind of bunny hopping over his fences. And I thought like he was he was going to get beaten. I didn't think he was going to win. Now, he did warm to his task very well. Mark Walsh was really patient on him, allowed him get into his rhythm and get into his race. And he was good in the end. But it, it wasn't a very strongly run race. The finishing percentage was 110 percent. So I, I, I think stepping out in trip like if we're looking at gold cup next year please god three miles two and a half furlongs it's not like he has to be trained as a gold cup horse obviously but he still has to prove that he can see out that type of trip whereas monty star i think he's just more of a staying horse and i thought he ran he ran really well he didn't do much wrong he was beaten by a better horse on the day probably for pace more than for stamina it's only his third run over fences as well having won his beginners chase a point to send back in new year's eve so I think, you know, for all the reasons Matt said, the half brother to Manley is really well bred. The Henry de Rumhead chases, they do tend to improve as, as they go on. He, I'd say he could probably improve again for stepping out in trip. And yeah, look, of course, fact to file, he's beaten him. So he has to be shorter in the Gold Cup market now than he, than, than Matthew Starr. But he's a lot, he's a lot shorter 
he's a fashionable horse. Monty Star maybe lost a wee bit of his luster because he was beaten, but I still think he ran a big race and an extra test of stamina or a, or a greater test of stamina that would suit Monty Star better. Okay, Matt, as someone who tipped up and backed Captain Guinness without favour, I feel I left something after me in the champion chase. I don't know what you, you feel about that. Uh, oh, I feel that was very lucky. It, it fell apart, didn't it? And it's always been a specialist division, uh, so relatively shallow race with a small number of good horses. Um, but increasingly, the big matchups don't happen. John Bond understandably missed the race, given the cloud the seven barrows horses were under. Um, and El Fabiola, when he blundered away his chance, he was the ninth of 12 odds on favourites this century to be beaten by this. I can't explain why. Um, Perhaps the lack of margin for error at the obstacles is, is what's causing it. And the finish was almost comical um, because Captain Guinness and Gentleman to Me were finishing less than 90%. Um, and they are both really a bit short finishers. You know, if you had a mile and a half race uh, chase, it would suit Captain Guinness absolutely perfectly. But he's an excellent jumper and you have to jump around. And that's what uh, won it for him. You know, a lot of people say, oh, what's it? point of having to go he's at 12 grade one attempt been beaten every time why are you running a horse like that this is why you run the horses um and sometimes the race the race will fall apart and they'll win one um there's been much discussion including from willie mullins about el fabiolo's jumping over the first four fences before he made his race ending blunder i don't think he was that much worse than it normally is i mean he isn't a great jumper or fluent jumper um so i wasn't particularly worried at that stage thinking he was going to do what he did um uh, it might be a bit of after timing. Hopefully, it won't affect his confidence. He's a bit stiff and sore, so they're going to try and get back from punches down. Um, hopefully, he can get back on track there because we really do need a, a one or two stars in this division to make it a bit more interesting than this race was. Yeah, Don, it makes no sense to me this champion chase. I agree with Matt on the margin of error, but it's the same course and distance as the arc, or maybe younger horses. I don't know. I just there's no. I, I don't have an explanation for all these odds on shots, Susan. Yeah, neither do I. Neither do I. Um... It is a race that has had 11th hour withdrawals in the past, isn't it? Like when, when Jeffrey Desoy, when he was sent off as odds on, there were a few defections from the race that year as well. Um, you know, maybe it's just that these two mile chasers, they have to be to be top class, they have to sail close to the wind in terms of jumping ability and fluency and speed over fences. Remember Moscow Flyer, he had that record, he'd, he'd win three and then unseat or, or fall, he'd win three more than unseat or fall. And that's the kind of nature of it. Like Moscow Flyer, he had his issues in this race as well as at the, the fourth last, I think it was the, the last ditch. Um, but yeah, look at Fabiolo. I, I, I got him wrong. I, I thought it didn't matter what mistakes he made. He just had such an engine. He was so powerful. He and he he just seemed to shrug off any mistakes that he made. And you know, as we discussed before, he does have mistakes in him. Uh, but in the past, he's always shrugged them off. He's never he was never beaten over fences before last week. And he just went on. And actually, the hallmark of of his jumping, I thought, was when he made a mistake, he went on to the next fence and he jumped. He often jumped that one well, so it didn't seem to phase him mentally either. But no, this it was just too bad a mistake. Paulton and pulled him up, and I suppose the fact that he's stiff and sore still, and in a race against time to get back for Punchestown, tells you that Paulton and did the right thing in pulling him up because you don't know what damage he would have caused if he continued on. Um, but look, great for Captain Guinness, his first Grade One win in a Champion Chase. Um, it was an aggressive ride from Rachel Blackmore as well. I'm not sure if she knew that El Fabiolo was gone behind her or not, but she put it up to Edwardstone then, and that, as Pat said, that explains the the, the slow finishing time plus the fact that Captain Guinness only just about gets two miles, an easy two miles, so it was always a worry about him going into the championship chase about how well he'd finish off his race, but he saw it off. He didn't He didn't storm up the hill or anything like it, but he saw it well enough to see off the challenge of Gentleman de May, and like he's a nine-year-old now, Captain Guinness, but yeah, look, I'm, 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 I'm glad for the horse that he's got his bed one win, got a champion chase on the board. Yeah, great horse, and uh, Rachel did say that uh, she was aware, so yeah, interesting how, knowing that, how she rode the race after that. Don, stick with you because Jasmine DeVoe, big winner for firstly Patrick Mullins picking correctly in the Willie Mullins yard, the correct bumper horse, but also uh, bringing up the 100 for his dad. So it was a, it was a brilliant point moment and it wasn't El Fabiola, but it felt fitting that it was the champion bumper. Yeah, champion bumper. I think it was the 13th win in the champion bumper. We thought it might be the Simon Veneer and Isaac Swed colours. It was, but it wasn't El Fabiola. Um, interesting reading Patrick Mullins yesterday saying that he kind of what he ran the course twice and he found a little strip just for about four off the rail and then the, the other better ground was wide and he kind of thought look in a, in a champion bumper are you going to get on that strip four off the rail no so he went wide and he went wide the whole way and delivered him with his run similar to Factify last year Factify found a dream to share just one one two good last year Jasmine DeVoe got there this time um 
that Romeo Coolio ran a big race around the inside. And Jelen Duderi's, like he was up handy from early. Three of the first five home were, were held up. Jasmine DeVoe was held up. Uh, Romeo Coolio was held up. Fisher Lane was held up. And they filled three of the first five places. So Jelen Duderi's, he was up just, just behind the leaders. And he did best of the horses who raced better than mid division from early. But no, good, good for Jasmine DeVoe. Like it was, it was a great clash between Jelen Duderi's and, and, and Jasmine DeVoe. They were the, the two who dominated the, the market from a long way out. And they, they more or less dominated the finish with Romeo Coolio getting in there among them. And Romeo Coolio, like he's probably, he, he didn't have a great preparation when he won his bumper in January at Ferry House. And the, the, the horse of a second went and won next time out. He's won another big race here. So he's, he's only a five-year-old as well, like the other three. He's a horse who can, who can come on from that. Um, but no, great for like Willie Mullins' 100th Chatham Festival winner. It's uh, yeah, quite incredible, really. Yeah, Matt, do you have a, do you have a couple of bets, a couple of darts in the bumper? Uh, yeah, I, well, one was uh, I backed up the day, and there was probably a non-runner. Um, I backed uh, Fleury Fusel a few days beforehand. She's well backed in for twenty-one point zero to eleven point zero. Didn't take the occasion too keen. Uh, she was one of those that the first time who didn't work the oracle on. Um, I, two of them that I'm interested in, and it's often a good race to look at the market here for for obvious reasons. One is uh, Don's talked about Romeo Culio. I absolutely agree with everything about that. Having gone up the inside, as Don pointed out, on the worst of the ground and that interrupted preparation, my hunch is he might be the best prospect in the field. Um, he had a very big reputation in the autumn. And then one in the market who was a no-show was Bill Joyce, who was 51.0 in the price-wise grid, opened 23.0 on the track, hammered into 8.0. So he didn't show, but that would have taken plenty of money to do that. Um, he's one to keep an eye on. Okay, watch the markets as always, not necessarily just the races. Uh, Gray Dotting, Matt, take it away. I thought this was a brilliant race. Uh, I back Fasal Vega like an absolute clown. That would be the last time. Uh, and I knew I was beat fairly early on, but it was a thrilling race, and I did thoroughly enjoy the finish. Uh, the, the, the best bet we can offer here is that it won't be the last time, Daniel. Um, <laughs> Um, he's he a proper cliff horse to people. I can understand uh, why as well. But uh, Great Dawning and Ginny's Destiny, uh, they pressed on with half a mile to go, burning J-Lo off. And nothing else really got into it. It was a bit of a surprise that they were allowed that, particularly after what Harry Cobden did last year on Stage Star. Uh, the difference here compared to the race in December was Ginny's Destiny has been a brilliant jumper from the word go. Grey Dawning was making mistakes, but obviously early on in the season, ploughed through the second last. Um, and couldn't quite get back up. Here it jumped really well, and with the emphasis on stamina, then there was only one winner, and he did idle in front, but given how he stayed in the Hampton over three miles, um, it wasn't him running out of stamina, so he was much the best on the day. Uh, excellent bit of placing by Dan Skelton, because this looked a, a pretty weak festival grade one, and although grade orange better over further, provided a better chance of a win than taking on Factor Viola Monty Star. Um, so I think he's one of those, he's about 13.0 for the Gold Cup, which looks about right. But compared to the obvious Mullins hot pots, um, he looks a bit better value. Wouldn't underestimate him. Yeah, Don, my thinking going into the race was, you know, they did it with Gaelic Warrior, they'll do it with Fasal Vega. And I, I looked back at it and I thought Gaelic Warrior had shown the form over fences, Fasal Vega hadn't. So I, I just got carried away with the hype. And a lot of people did. Um, so it's important to learn, learn really <laughs> important to learn about these things. It is every day of school day, but yeah, sometimes you, do, you repeat the same things again, as I often do, and think, God, I should have learned from the previous one. But Fasa Vega, look, I suppose the, the thinking was stepping up and trip, that was going to bring about improvement and maybe put less pressure on his jumping. But on, on the race IQ data, he lost over nine lengths jumping, and Grey Downing gained 12 lengths jumping. So that's what, 21 lengths, and he was beaten 17 lengths. So there's only four lengths of a difference there if he can get his jumping sorted out. I was but just no, going to say, if he if he improves his jumping, he's the Ryan Air Horse next year then. Oh, there you go. So all hope is not lost. You might back him again yet. Um, no, I agree with Matt on the race. Like It's it's the old rivals, isn't it? Ginny's Destiny and Grey Dawning. Grey Dawning made that mistake at the second last fence when Ginny's Destiny beat him and only just beat him at the December meeting. Um, now into a grade one, he was three pounds better off. I think he was, he was, he was getting three pounds the last day. And it was a good old match between the two of them. They had it between them from a long way out. Jello matched strides with them for a long way and then just faded from the second last. And then Ginny's Destiny made a bit of a mistake at the second last fence. So, but it, look, it wasn't the difference between winning and losing Grey Dawning. It always looked like he was getting the better of him. He's a Hampton Chase winner, as Matt said. So he stays well. And yeah, it was it was another good bit of placing, wasn't it? Like Dan Skelton, obviously, maybe avoiding fact to file going for this race instead of the 
Crown Advisory, Henry Rommel with Slade Steel going for the Supreme. That was instead of the the maybe said the Neptune there, the Bering Bingham, the Gallagher to uh, where Ballyburn was. So um, yeah, he, he did it well. He stays well. He's probably yeah, and he definitely has to be a staying chaser in the mix for next season. Um, maybe a King George might suit him a bit, a bit better than a Gold Cup. And is he is he that dour kind of stamina laden horse who can go and, and and win a Gold Cup? Maybe, but maybe a King George would be would be a better race for him. And um, nothing really got into it from behind. Like I watched the race again this morning, and you kind of they always had a bit of a break. Zana here travelled well into the race. Iroko travelled well for a long. While. I wouldn't give up on Iroko yet. Like there's a, there's a there's a talented horse in there. He had a, obviously had a nightmare preparation for this. It would have been some training performance by Oliver Greenland, Josh Guerrero, if they'd got him back to win any race at the Chantley Festival. But I think he's a stamina horse as well. Like he won the the Martin Pie Party last year through stamina. I thought he outstayed no ordinary Joe. Um, and maybe going back up and trip like it's a pity he has a, he has a win now so he's not going to be a novice for next season but um still think there's a he's only a six year old so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't give up on Iroko yet he could be a good horse in waiting yet okay and keeping with the Dan Skelton team Matt another brilliant winner and another brilliant bit of placing for Protector uh, absolutely really good bit of placing he's been keen hadn't he the idea of dropping him down in trip to uh, stronger gallop helping settle made sense. I wasn't sure he'd have the speed for it, but on this ground, at least, um, he did. Understandably, the owner's been trying to make him a Gold Cup horse, um, and he continued a long tradition of horses that have run in open three-mile grade ones earlier in the season, been beaten, and then coming to win the Ryanair. So if you're playing anti-post on this race, uh, having a look at those races uh, in the autumn and over Christmas is a, a good pointer. He'll be a veteran come next year's renewal, so doesn't look an obvious candidate for a repeat um, but it was great to see him get a day in the sun. Envoy Lem well backed again, uh, 5.0 into 3.25. Couldn't quite pull it off. Rachel said afterwards it may have looked like she was holding on to more than she was. Um, he's already 10, so it's hard to see him winning at festival for a fourth time. But along with Cue Card, he's the only winner of the festival bumper this century to go on and win an open grade one over jumps. So been a fantastic servant to connections. And the eye catcher here for me was Capadano. He looked a real threat turning in, given he stays much further. Wasn't great two out, just stayed on the, the one pace. The vibes from the Mullins camp have been that this was actually a bit of a prep for the national. So 161 is quite a high mark, but um, he's about 26.0. I wouldn't put anyone off that. Yeah, Don, I think Matt's stealing your thunder a bit on Capadano. <laughs> Sorry, Don. Yeah, yeah, makes, makes a change for me stealing his. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, Capadano. Look, I, I, I backed him for the national. I was very, very happy to see him run as like he did. Um, he, he was never entered in the Gold Cup for some reason, but the Rhino Chase was always going to be too short for him. And yeah, there was a lot to like by the way they said. Wordingly though, somebody mentioned the, the bowl afterwards that he might go for, to go for the bowl instead of the national. Uh, hopefully that's just that, that's not going to be relevant. So hopefully go because he you know he, he ran very well in the national last year. I know he was pulled up in the end, but he had a, a, a poor preparation for it. He had a truncated season last season. He jumped the fence as well. So yeah, he's definitely on on on, a, on he should be on a, a, a anybody's national radar. But protect right, yeah, it was very good. I actually thought Envo Allen was coming to win his race. It was it looked like a carbon copy of the race last year for me. And Rachel delivered him on the outside and looked like he was going to pick up. But it was interesting, as Matt said, to hear Rachel say afterwards that she wasn't holding on to as much as it looked like she would. And ultimately, Protect Right just quickened up a wee bit better. But um, yeah, the, look, who knew Protect Right? He's a, he's, a, he's a two and a half miler. He's a, isn't he? he's a bet fair chase winner. So he does have that type of stamina. But um, yeah, John Hale's search for a Gold Cup winner goes on. But in the interim, he's got a really good Ryanair chase winner. Yeah, and it, it, uh, there were some great celebrations in the winners' enclosures on Thursday. It really got the festival roaring back to life after a, a sort of quiet couple of days on track. We'll move on to the stairs. Dom, stick to you. Another horse you've been chasing around price ever since he's had his grace win. Tiapu, um, fresh. This, that was the key, wasn't it? He ran so much better than last year. Uh, he, he was so superior, wasn't he? Like he made a mistake at the second last. He wasn't great at the last either, but it didn't it didn't halt him. Like he won by nearly four lengths with more in hand than that. And look, fair play to Gordon Elliott and the Rob Kerr connections because on Hatton's Grace Hurdle Day, they said he's going straight to the stairs hurdle. And I know it's not ideal and you know the, the Cheltenham is everything type vibe, but they had Irish point to go and win the Christmas hurdle, so why not go and leave him off? Like they, they said he's a better horse fresh. Um, he was eight for eight after a break of, of of fifty days or more going into the race, including his, his race course debut. He's now nine for nine after a break. So, um, 
that that made all the sense in the world. And Jack Kennedy said afterwards that he was kind of looking at Keith Donahue and Florian Porter and thinking that he didn't want him to get too far away. And in the end, when Florian Porter faded, he found himself in front earlier than ideal, but he kept on really well, stayed on well. It was a big run by Florian Porter. Good to say, again, I thought he'd be a national punt chase horse. Um, probably wouldn't have hit in Corbett's Cross, as it turned out, which I'm sure we'll discuss in a minute. Um, but ran a, another big race, like he said, dual stairs hurdle winner with the with the you know lost it last year and came back and would have would have won it this year in the absence of Tia Pool. Homo de Lee was good to see him bounce back. That was a much better run from him. And Buddy won for Paul Gilligan. He ran a massive race. Like he does go well at Cheltenham. He ran a big race in the Martin Pipe hurdle last season. Um, he he won the three mile handicap hurdle at Cheltenham earlier in the season. And he like he was a big big prize here. But I I thought he ran he ran really well and. He proved that he, he belonged in this type of company. So he's a horse that, you know, he's a big price from a small yard. He might still be under the radar. So he's a horse that I just keep in mind maybe going on to Punchestown. Yeah, Matt, your thoughts? Uh, absolutely echo that. I think Tia Hooper was brilliant on the test on the day. As Don said, much the best here. I would just want to see him um, on a sound surface in a strongly run race before I would crown him the undisputed champion. Um, and as Don says, home by the Lee, run much better here. If we got a really strongly run race, they get racing early at Aintree, and it can be a real test of stamina for all it's a sharp track, uh, or even at Punchestown. I wouldn't be surprised to see him win a grade one if he's on a going day. And absolutely echo Don's comments on Buddy One. He hadn't um, even started racing till just over 18 months ago. He's been kept busy since, but horses learn over time as well as through races. Jack Gilligan couldn't claim his seven pounds here. If you add that back in, he comes out the second best horse in the race. So as both Buddy One and Jack gain more experience, he's the one I can see improving into next year. OK, we move on to Friday. We're covering all the great ones here. We'll have a little section at the end to cover handicaps, etc. But Don, Majbra, I would have been singing from the rooftops of this from the morning. Only I, I got on a Ryanair flight on Friday morning and he was favoured. And I went, I came off and I swear to God, he was third or fourth favourite. Dino blew the same. He drifted as well. Why, I was like, why are my two horses just drifted? The flight is 40 minutes. So That's what you get for getting on the flight. Um, <laughs> yeah, ah, look, he was he was weak in the market. It was worrying. Um, he was four to one the week before I had with Sergino in the race, and then Sergino came out. He thought it was all it was all coming in his favour, and suddenly he's just he's weak in the mark. Look, he was very good. He won it through stamina. Carjesi, she ran a big race as well. She travelled like the most likely winner into the home straight, and looked like she'd go on and win it. But Majbera, like, and, and that was the kind of thinking, wasn't it, that the, the triumph hurdle would suit him because he's he's a staying type of horse over two miles, like Willie Mullins. When he was told that he was a triumph hurdle horse, he said he thought it looked like more like a gold cup horse than a triumph hurdle horse. He said. Um, but no, he was very good. Again, Mark Walsh, very good on him. Um, and he, he kind of moved a bit to his left on the run-in, but he was always going forward. He got the better for Daisy and reversed places with, with her from the spring hurdle. As often happens, Countrywide Flame did it, Tiger Roll did it, Farclad did it, Lossie Mouth did it. You know, it's a, it's a the spring hurdle, as we discussed before, and it is a race from which the beaten horses can come forward and reverse placings, whether it's down to the experience that they gain or the different configuration of, of Cheltenham compared to Leopardstown, whatever it is, it does often, like, look, it often happens that spring hurdle winners go and win it um, as well. Like Calixius won both, Woban won both, but um, beating horses from the spring hurdle, it is a fertile ground for, for, for triumph hurdle winners. And Majbra, look, you can see him again next season being a chaser. It is hard for five-year-olds. I mean, we talk about it a lot, five-year-olds in hurdles. It's hard for them, but it's also hard for five-year-olds when they go chasing novice chases. Like Boy for says is the last Arkle winner who was five, and he was getting an allowance. Started my Hazen is the last um, Brown Advisory winner who was who was five, and he was getting an allowance as well. I think a ten pounds allowance back then. Um, they don't get those allowances anymore. But Majbura, yeah, look, he'll be he'll be an exciting chaser for next season. And Kargesi, yeah, I could I could see her. I'm not sure if Majbura is going to go to Punchestown now or not, but I could see her maybe reversing places with Majbura. At point of sound where the emphasis is more it's more on speed than on stamina yeah of course definitely suited um matt measure would be exciting chaser next year with all the allowances early on in the season yeah that wouldn't be willie's style quite so much It'd be more of a gordon elliott sort of thing wouldn't it you know he'd only get two pounds if he was in the turners next year um i can't imagine he'd be in the brown advisory getting four pounds as don said that that's completely different to when we had 10 pounds in the brown advisory and between five and, and seven or eight pounds in the article so really tough for five-year-olds um it'd be interesting to see whether they do mark time a bit uh, and let him strengthen up 
uh, especially after what Willie's done with Lossy Mouth, albeit she's probably a permanent hurdler. Uh, the eye catcher for me was Nurburgring here. He was out the back, never in contention, just stayed on to be fourth. Um, he has form on all sorts of ground. Perhaps he didn't enjoy this. Perhaps he just wants further. Um, he'd be the one I'd be keeping an eye on, probably best judged after another run. Okay, Matt, stick to the Albert Barlett and got up on the line with Stellar Story. Tipped up by Michal DC and back by yourself as well. It's uh, some performance. You messaged me saying, what's Jack Kennedy not doing on Stellar Story? It was the first thing I thought of when he crossed the yeah. line that Jack Kennedy, I actually watched Jack Kennedy look back at uh, Sam Ewing uh, being interviewed. And I, I just thought, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's annoying when you get one wrong like that because it seemed they were both very similar on outsider-wise, but obviously, obviously not. Yeah, and I think it was because um, Stella Story was a chicken stand replacement for Croke Park who got injured. And it's just about this race. You know, though there are only 13 runners here, even so, nine of the previous 10 winners have gone off a double figure price because it's a di completely different test to anything the runners have tried before. So if you've got a horse with a realistic chance like Stella Story, why wouldn't you run him and Croke Park? Um, he was he was good. He was really tough. He stayed on well. Very exciting. I uh, followed DCM. I mean, it's a it's a hard race to find the winner on the day, but to find him anti post at a big price. Um, hats off to DC for that. I, you'd have felt a bit sorry if I, if I'd been backing him for the jukebox man. Um, he looked the best horse in the race. Really, perhaps went a, a little bit soon um, and just got ran out of it. He'd be one, I would have thought, uh, would be a really good chasing prospect for next season, more for the Brown Advisory, whereas um, Stella Story does look an out-and-out -out stayer. Uh, I know Jigginstown not that keen on the National Hunt chase, but I can imagine that um, he might be more the, the type for that. And as ever, be forgiving of horses who've not taken to this test and, and just run badly, like reading Tommy Wrong did. Um, he was a ludicrous price, given the nature of the race, but it doesn't mean that he's not a good prospect going forward. You can put a line through this. Um, but I thought Stella's story was really tough and game and an excellent ride from Sam Ewing uh, and the jukebox man, an excellent prospect as well. They were you know, dominated the race from the front and the others didn't get into it. So you, maybe they were a little bit flatter for that, but I do think that they're two good prospects and this is decent form. Yeah, Don, I thought Keelan Wood's got a lot right with the ride, to be fair. And look, at the end of the day, he lost by, lost by a head. It was so, so unlucky. It would have been an incredible ride otherwise, a front-running ride in the Albert Barda, like. Yeah, it would have been. And um, he didn't he didn't go too fast. The the, the, the finishing section was tell us that. And yeah, just unlucky on the day. And as Matt said, they, they had it between them from a long way out. Um, Sam Ewing, he's only he's only a young rider. It's the first Shotland Festival winner. He's only 20. Of course, he's Warren Ewing's son of, of Constitution Hill fame. Um, so great for him to get his first, uh, I think it was his first grade one win as well as the first Shotland Festival win. And Gordon, it was Gordon Elliott's first Albert Bartlett hurdle, which surprised me. I hadn't, I hadn't won it before, given the type of horses that he has. But no, great. And the the the, the final furlong, Seller Story's final furlong, was almost a second faster than the Jukebox Man's final furlong. And Sam Ewing was saying afterwards that he just saw a Jukebox Man just kind of flagging on, on the run in and he um like you know he, he, he got his horse going forward and seller story stays really well and um, whether he's a kind of a grade one type staying horse for next season i'm not sure it might be more that he'd be a, a, you know, one of those horses one of those gordon and jigginson horses for the the high class handicaps maybe next season. he might be better than that but he's a horse who um obviously he stays really well so those those um staying handicap chases they they're definitely an option if he proves that he's not quite up to the grade one level um, and yeah, because as, as Matt was saying, it's a again the Albert Barton hurdle. It's a race that, like, you just it's it's very very difficult. History tells us that it's very difficult to work it out. And the, you know the horses, like the reading Tommy Wrong type horses who look like they're they're going to, um, they're going to take an awful lot of beating. It just often happens that it's. It, it, I'm not sure why that is. Go back to you know similar to the Champion Chase. Maybe it's because it's such a unique test. It's such such a stamina test for novices over three miles. Um, on the last day of the festival, maybe on the worst of the ground as well. I know it's the second day of the new course, um, and maybe they're just asked to do things that they that they that they haven't been asked to do before because it is a real, it's a, it's a true stamina test. Yeah, I backed uh, Reed and Tommy wrong, so um, I will learn. I will learn for next year. Fast Vega, Reed and Tommy wrong. I can go through them, but I won't. We will uh, crack on. Don, I know you want to briefly mention uh, Corbett's Cross. Um, Fantastic performance. He was the best source in the race one. It's so obvious afterwards, isn't it? 
Yeah, he was. Look, I, I was worried about his stamina. I thought the, the Albert Brown had heard last season. He didn't prove that he stayed the trip going up to three miles six, that that might test him. But look, you know, the race fell apart a wee bit. Embassy Gardens, obviously, that wasn't his running. And Corvus Cross probably didn't have a huge amount to beat in the end. But he couldn't have been any more impressed than he was in, in winning it. His final furlong was 15.52 seconds, according to Race IQ. And that's the fastest final furlong of any chase for the week, which is incredible at the end of three miles and six furlongs. But look, he, he did it really well. And um, for Derek O'Connor, he was so unlucky, wasn't he? He won the first two amateur rider races and was beaten the half length of the cross of a length in the third one. I don't think anybody's won all three amateur rider races ever in the same year at the festival. But Derek O'Connor, like he was, he was very good. Um, on him, he's very good in another way of thinking as well. The Kim Muir, but Corbett's Cross, I, I think he might be a wee bit underrated. Like, I, and uh, the, all the talk is of fact to file as you know, JP's Gold Cup horse for next season. But I think Corbett's Cross, like this National Hunt chase in recent years, it has produced horses who've gone on to the top level. And, um, yeah, I think that like the pace that he showed at the end, and I, like you could see him when Dirk Connor asked him, and he did ask him, but he quickened, he quickened up the hill. Um, so yeah, I, I think he's he's a, he's a really interesting horse now for the top staying chases next season. Yeah, my quick line on him. I absolutely agree with that. And it, the crucial bit, as Don has explained, it were the sectionals that they went very steadily as they often do in that race. So punters might think, oh, he's just a slogger, three mile six and heavy ground. Um, actually, he's got a lot of pace. And even though it wasn't a test of stamina at that trip, it showed that he stayed well. Um, yeah, I definitely have him on the radar for the Gold Cup. Okay, we'll move on to the handicaps and give give the guys free reign to go where they want to go with this. But I do want to start with Langer Dan and the sort of uh, aftermath and fallout from Langer Dan. And I guess it's always been a case down of playing the game. I guess maybe there's Dan Scout probably took the piss, or he definitely did take the piss for most of the runs uh, this season, considering the starting prices and the ride those horses got. What is your take on that? And I guess comparing it to other Irish horses, because I give the example, I know the way you're thinking to be the same thing only a bit more subtle perhaps yeah look, it's a tough one because that's you know you're not going to win handicaps if you're not well handicapped and how do you get horses well handicapped like i have no issue with horses progressing through the ranks and where trainers have a target in mind at like let's say at cheltenham and they train a horse to peak for that target but for a horse to you know be up at a level and then come back down and go back up again look you know you can argue it's that that's 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 the nature of handicapping. You know, you're, you're not going to win it if you're not well handicapped. But to get back down to a mark, same mark as last year, yeah, like it's um, it's a tough one. Like, with another way of thinking, like I was surprised he got a mark of 145 to get into the Kim Muir. I, I didn't think he'd get into the Kim Muir. So, um, yeah, he was, they're obviously too, <laughs> obviously two well well handicapped horses. But I'm not sure what the answer is, Dan. You know, it's it's um, it's the nature of handicapping. If you're not well handicapped, you're not going to win a handicap. Yeah, Matt, your your takeaway that because if it, it felt like a lot of social media, and in fairness, it wasn't a case of after time. A lot of people weren't happy with the marks Langer Dan got throughout the season, and being dropped down, dropped down, dropped down. He got back to his mark. But again, I, I go back to the point: it, a lot of this happens all the, every day of the week. It was just a lot more obvious, glaring obvious, in black and white that um, people ultimately weren't happy. Yeah, and it's because it's Langer Dan because it's been happening to that one horse for several seasons. But he was down six pounds. Montmorel was down seven pounds. Won the attempt. People weren't jumping up and down about that. I mean, the newish BHA method of dropping horses quicker, in theory, is fairer. Provides highly rated horses that aren't progressive, who had no chance of these sort of handicaps before, gives them a chance. But it does invite plotting, uh, as I've said on that matchbook insights article and you lads have said today that's the game everyone has to play it it's the stewards job to regulate it the handicaps job to interpret it but i'm not going to criticize those like dan skelton who are better than most of their colleagues at playing the system we have in place yeah four winners from 11 runners i think for dan skelton absolutely incredible strike rate don for you handicaps anything to take away i mean personally the, the martin pipe's always a good race i think these are four really really good horses but anywhere else you'd like to go yeah, I, I agree with you on, on the Martin Pipe. Um, like better days ahead, he he's a strong stayer, isn't he? Like he, he won it through stamina again, stayed on really well on the far side for Danny Gilligan. Thought answer to Kaif, our old buddy, my old buddy anyway, he ran a big race. He was keen through the early part of the race, but that's the way he runs. He is keen and good training performance by Terence O'Brien to get in there. Great ride by John Shinnick as well. He delivered him on the outside and he was he wasn't he wasn't beaten very far. And the four of them finished well clear of the rest of Waterford Whispers and K de Bourbon in there as well um made of Orban, as, as tom stanley pointed out was likely to be ridden by a very good rider so michael o'sullivan he's some acid in a 
in the conditional riders race um he qualified to ride in the race obviously because i think he had one winner left when with, uh, on his claim at the start of this season so that qualified him and um, but no like the martin pipe hurdle um it's always a race that i i take particular interest in like alan finish on one of three years ago banbridge and iroko two anti-post bets that went astray for me the last two winners but uh you know un uh, unlike you dan i probably won't learn from my earlier yeah, keep hours keep going keep going <laughs> i'll probably have better days ahead on my radar at some point uh or some of the other three in behind for the for the staying races for next season but um yeah look i know the way you're thinking he's a he's a he's a grade one horse isn't he i think he got 11 pounds for winning the tim muir and again like i mentioned earlier on it was it was Derek o'connor at his best like it, it, it wasn't happening from early on he, he he lost a very good position that he had on the inside and he was jumping to his right but Derek o'connor obviously the confidence in his horse allowed him settle into his race and, and delivered him and won really impressively in the end so he's a horse who um it wouldn't be surprising to see him competing in the in, in some of the top staying races next season as well or even between now and the end of the season and um, an absurd i'll leave to matt yeah well i'm certain well i want to i want to observe because i um he was the he was the one he was absolutely incredible the way he sorry dan yeah he, sorry. yeah it's i'm 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 insulted dan to be honest but um, <laughs> that form in that 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 form in that dublin racing festival uh race the two miler between body bear and slade steel obviously king of kingsfield didn't quite get there but absurd um i thought it was a really good run there really good prep for the county hurdle the, the agile campaign horse again on the flat so really impressed delighted but also he handled the heavy ground so he can do both hurdles and the flat so quite an exciting prospect for Odie Munns as if he didn't need any more Matt handicap wise anything to stand out to you I definitely echo that was absurd you know running a Galway the Ebor um, Melbourne Cup uh, DRF and then come in here. I mean, those horses normally they're running in races like the Cesarovics in the autumn and prime for that have a terrible record at Cheltenham because they're primed for you know the start of October. Very hard to do that, as you said, not on the ground he'd have wanted. So that really suggests if they prioritise um, hurdles rather than the flat, he could easily be a Grade One horse the next season. And just talking about not learning your lessons, um, I just wanted to touch on the Potemps debacle. Yes, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. Then this race confirmed I'm ready for the giggle jacket. On the last trail, I talked about punting weaknesses and one of mine being um, I get a good anti-post position, a festival race, and then not focus on the race again because I'm spending all my time on the races I don't yet have a bet in. I backed Gabby's cross anti-post. was really sweet on him. He's my biggest handicap bet of the week. Didn't look at the race again properly post declarations. Last season, I put Monmorel up as my novice to follow on our Jumpers to Follow show. Two episodes ago, I put Monmorel up as an eye catcher, wondering, yeah, is he going to be Potemps final or will it be Aintree, having finished fourth in the qualifier at Chepstow? Yeah, he went off 26.0, 29.0 in the morning. Now, we all have plenty of horses we fancy and don't back, especially in the big field handicaps. There's always a winner or two uh, that get away at the festival. Monmorel was, was mine this year, so perhaps next year I'll learn. Yeah, no. Uh... No sympathy for you there, Matt, unfortunately. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on to Aintree, Punchestown, Fairy Hills, maybe, but at least talk about the Spring Festivals. Uh, firstly, Don, as an overall picture, again, I'm sure if you listen to me every year, I say this, but I am so, so excited for these next three festivals. I really, really am. I think they're going to be absolutely incredible, given how a lot of the Cheltenham Festival race has played out. Who are you most looking forward to seeing, and what sort of horses should we keep on the radar or keep on side going into those festivals? Yeah, like the thing about Pointerstown versus Cheltenham, they're two very, very different tracks. Like obviously one's left handed, one's right handed for starters. Um and while Pointerstown, it's a big track, it's a it's a it's a big wide track, it can be pace favoring, like it doesn't have the stiff finish that Cheltenham has. And generally, unless they go very, very quickly up front, you don't want to be too far behind the pace of Pointerstown. So it, it is a very different track and horses who have either run poorly or been beaten at Cheltenham can come on here and um, do well. Of course, there's the Willie Mullins factor as dominant as Willie Mullins is at Cheltenham. He's even more dominant at Pointerstown, so um, that's obviously going to be a factor again. But yeah, like as I mentioned earlier on, I think Cargazi, I think she's got a chance in the, the champion four-year-old hurdle, yeah, even if Majbury does run in the race of reversing places. I thought that given how well she travels, she can be a wee bit keen, but she's she's getting a bit better as she's gaining an experience. So um, She's one I'd have in my mind for for punch then for the four-year-old hurdle. Um, fast or slow as well. Fast or slow. 
Well, just uh, on that, so it, it turns out I've completely forgotten about the Gold Cup, uh, Don. <laughs> so if you want to maybe take take away the Gold Cup, I got so excited going through all the list of horses that um, I've completely forgotten about the Gold Cup. So maybe fast or slow. It was an unlucky unsee, right? I've watched ah, it. Yeah. It's one of those... I don't know really what happens. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. It was, he was obscured, wasn't he? I think it was Gallop and the Champ who was between the camera and um, the horse. But I was I was watching on the big screen. And I kind of took my eye off him and looked looked back to see how everything else had jumped the race, and and then he was gone. So then you know watching the replay again, it, it is hard to see what happened. Um, it's just one of those things that it's just unfortunate. But he didn't get to, we didn't get to see, we didn't get to know, and that's the frustrating part. We didn't get to see how he would fare against Gallop in the Shop, who was brilliant again. And you know, all I know, Jerry Colom ran a massive race in defeat, but it never looked like he was getting to him. And Lose horse or no lose horse, lose fast or slow or no lose fast or slow. And Paul Townend was clever. He kind of used him to make sure Jack Kennedy was still inside and Jerry Kalam and Jack had to switch out. But look, it was race riding. It was good race riding. It was maximizing your chance of winning. But he probably didn't need it. Gallop in the champ. He was superior in, in the end. And now, uh, brilliant. Like two two gold cups in a row. Um, Album Photo and Best Mate, they're the only two to win two gold cups in a row. And uh, Okada Star won two, but not in a row since the Scargo. So it's a big performance. And yeah you have to you have to give him a chance of, of going and, and doing the unthinkable and winning three in a row as well. He's the standard setter, isn't he? Um but no fast or slow back at Punchestown. He won the Punchestown Gold Cup last year. He beat Gallup in the shop and Brave Man's game, the Gold Cup one two there. He won the John Durkin chase at Punchestown this season in the early part of the season, beat Gallup in the shop again. And this year and like you know, you wouldn't have chosen it, but he was spared a hard race in the Gold Cup for all that he did complete without his rider. Um, Caleb and Deschamps can't have not had a hard race having won the Gold Cup. So if they do meet again at Punchestown, um, I think Faster Slow has a good chance of, of reversing places. Uh, yeah, I think he's a he's an interesting one. A few more in mind for for other races, but yeah, that's kind of my my there my two big thoughts on Punchestown. Okay, yeah, we'll come back to you for Angie in a sec. So Matt, on the Gold Cup. Well, we, I mean, galloping was pretty, it was an honor to be there, to be honest, because I thought it was a really good occasion and he delivered. He, and there was never a moment's worry. He was sat in third. I couldn't believe how well forward. I know we put, we talked about this, but I couldn't believe how forward he was in the race. And he absolutely cruised home in the end, albeit the, the loose horse gave it a, a couple of scary moments. Uh, he was magnificent, wasn't he? Uh, plenty to be negative about this year's festival, especially over the first couple of days. We shouldn't sugarcoat that there is real need for reform but the gold cup shone out as a highlight not only was it a terrific race it featured a winner that had run in three grade one races already this season you back when i was getting into racing between 1990 and 2000 uh, 80 of the 11 gold cup winners ran between five and eight times during the gold cup winning season you saw the horses that's what got people interested in racing um, and with the ultra cautious campaigning of plenty of the other best horses over the winter being, I think, a big contributor to fans drifting away from the sport. Galapin de Champ gave us a real lift, um, hard enough to come back for a second crack at the Gold Cup, but winning the Savills chase in the Irish Gold Cup en route, which no one had done before and won at Cheltenham. Uh, he's a truly great horse. I guess most of us would have him the best staying chaser of the post quarto star, Den Manera. This was a tough race in bad ground, but he, again, he looked to win pretty easily. So I really hope he can come back next year, go for a similar programme, um, because he's a, a flag bearer that we can use to attract people and keep racing fans within the sport. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, one eye catcher on it, just wanted to mention, was Jungle Boogie, who pulled like a train through the race till blundering three out, then faded. He stood training this year for the first time um, this season. So with the benefit of hindsight, the Ryanair was probably his race. He'll be 11 next year, um, but he hasn't got many miles on the clock. If he stays in one piece... He's one to keep an eye on because he does look a really good horse. Yeah, agree with every word, re-competitiveness and racing and seeing horses outside the Cheltenham Festival. Matt Aintree, take it away. Any horses on your shortlist? Yeah, I've mentioned a couple. Tell her the name and uh, Fleury Fusil. Might be the nickel coin mare's bumper there. Might be punches down. Be interested in both of those. Um, always do a, a look through of which horses have been backed if um, they've either run poorly or just run okay and see if there's a reason for for that confidence um, that was just didn't work out on the day one is daily present who was back from 15.0 to 6.5 for the Kim Muir uh, Paul Nolan who's very good target trainer for Cheltenham uh, he was keen there 28 lengths fifth to uh, I know the way you're thinking 
He'd beaten Bron in a novice hurdle a couple of seasons ago. He's won through three over hurdles, missed all last season, been hunting around in beginner's chases, and then won a handicap of 120 before he came here. He's 127 in Ireland, so he could win a big staying handicap before the end of the season. Um, one eye catcher who might go on to Aintree was um, in the plate in Inix Chelsea's Deo. He'd been running well over two miles all season. If you'd never seen him before this race, you'd have thought he wants three miles. Always looked in top gear. We know by now how hard it is to win those mid-distance handicap chases in Cheltenham from off the pace, right out the back. Badly hampered in the melee, four out. Finished like a train to be four and a quarter lengths fifth. He goes on better ground, been left on one three seven. Um, he looks handicapped to win a good race this spring, especially uh, when conditions favour those patiently ridden. Hey, yeah, I forgot about that gamble on Daily Present. It was absolutely extraordinary, uh, considering there was another gamble in the race, obviously. Don, uh, who's flying your flag on your entry team? Um, Capadano, we've already mentioned, I thought he ran a big Grand National trial in the Ryanair chase, staying on. And yeah, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier on, I think he's a Grand National horse. He does have a, he's, he's got a plenty of weight now with Hewick out, but he might have the class to be able to carry that weight. Um, Irish point, I think going back to entry, uh, either the entry hurdle, as you said, Dan, maybe the Liverpool hurdle, because um, he did win the three mile hurdle, the Christmas hurdle, the episode over Christmas, but that they went slowly in that race and he probably won it more through pace and stamina and Gordon Elliott and Jack Kennedy were both, you know, not, it just had to be convinced that he was a true three mile horse. So it'll be interesting to see where they go, although the, the presence of Bob Ollinger in the entry hurdle, maybe that will influence thinking. Uh, Wacker Clan, I thought Wacker Clan ran a big race in the Kim Muir. He was, he led from early and he was probably forced into going a wee bit faster, a wee bit earlier than ideal by Demnat when he took him on in, the, in, in front, but I thought he ran, he ran a big race and kept on well to, to finish third fall. There was no there was no beating another way of thinking. I thought he ran a good race as well in third. So wherever he goes now, if he goes, Mike, you know, Henry Durham, does like entry, but um, yeah, it might be that he will show up at entry in, in the three mile handicap chase there. Okay, yeah, before we get on to chat on 2025, I think there's top Gaelic Warriors going to run in Ferry House on Easter Sunday, all being well, and if he comes out of the race well, which again, will be extremely a uh, brilliant occasion for the track. So yeah, run the horses if they're fit and well. Chat on 2025. So I approached the guys with the, the thought of this and a few, sh there was a lot of more horses coming back to me than I thought, or at least a talk of a lot more horses. So Matt, give us your shortlist and maybe between the three of us, we might come up with some sort of fun multiple, but this is Chat on 2025. Just a fun look ahead at, at the anti-post markets as we're recording on the 21st of March, 2024. Yeah, absolutely. This is a fun patent for Cheltenham, all at long prices. So one winner out of the three would give a nice return, um, and more than that would be great. The first one's Monty Starr, uh, mentioned 21.0 for the Gold Cup, ran a blinder in the Broadway for a horse who still looks a work in progress to me. So little chasing experience. He looks the obvious improver in the race to me. Um, Mr Mulligan, long run, Milela Indo, all placed in the Broadway before winning the Gold Cup the next year. I wouldn't photo would have been had he not come down. So I like him at the price. The factor file's too short, as we've discussed earlier, with Grey Dawning and Monty's pass too big. Um, I thought the jukebox man shaped uh, as the best horse in the Albert Bartlett uh, for all he got to dictate terms. That's produced six of the last 15 Broadway winners. 25.0 looks a big price given how good a record Ben Pauling is developing at targeting the festival. And finally, a horse that didn't run at the festival. Um, Blood Destiny looks an out-and-out two-miler to my eye. Uh, Willie didn't see it that way. Uh, he was going to be going for the two mile four grade one novice at Fairy House. If Gaelic Warrior shows up there, maybe he'll be kept for the two miler at Punches Down. Sometimes Willie's horses end up running over the wrong distance because he's got so many good horses to perm. Um, Champion Chase fell apart again. Yeah, only the Mercurial Gaelic Warrior looks a realistic contender from this year's Arkle. So the division is open. Blood Destiny's only five, got some maturing to do. Didn't take the hullabaloo of the festival in last year's triumph. So I'm hopefully he'll go down the two mile route and by next March be ready to fulfill his potential. Um, he's an exciting prospect if he goes the right way. He's a 34.0 chance. So my fun patent is uh, Monty Star 21.0 for the Gold Cup, the Jukebox Man 25.0 for the Broadway, and Blood Destiny 34.0 for the Champion Chase. That's a real trends patent. I like it. Um, I can see all those horses getting there, and I can see all those horses running well. So yeah, maybe one. To keep an eye on there, Don. Can you uh, can you beat that with any shouts to take it away? So. Oh, couldn't beat that. In fact, I'll equal it. I, I fully agree on Monty Star. Um, 
again, as we discussed yeah. earlier on, he's a he's a stamina horse. I think the extra two and a half furlongs will give him every chance of reversing places with fact to file. And as Matt said, I think he's a horse who will continue to improve given his pedigree and his experience or lack thereof. And the fact that he's trained by Henry de Bromhead, you know he's going to continue to to progress. And, he, you know, he proved as well at the weekend, like he was pulled up in the other part of the hurdle last year. So he had to go and prove that he could operate at Cheltenham when he proved on, on, on Wednesday that he can. Um, same with the Henry de Bromhead theme, Slade Steele for the Arkle, as we mentioned earlier on. He was a very good winner of the Supreme Novices hurdle. Um, everything about him suggests that he'll be better over fences. It looks like that's the way he's going to go. And while his pedigree says that he could be better over further, and he did he did win the grade two novice novices hurdle over two and a half miles. And that's a race that as Matt alluded to earlier on, it's been it's been it's worked out really well. Um I think he could he could have the pace as well for an Arkle. He's 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 got like he, he showed on Tuesday that he had the pace for the Supreme Novices hurdle. And Rachel Blackmore did say after the Leopard Sound race that that was the first time that she thought he had that pace. So it could be a horse who could be faster and, and more pacey over fences than over hurdles. And he's probably going to be a better chaser than hurdler, as a lot of the Henry de Bromhead horses are. Um, I'd add Corbett's Cross to the Gold Cup mix as well. I think he's under the radar a little bit. I think he's overpriced at the minute for the Gold Cup. He's a National Hunt Chase winner, not a Brown Advisory winner. So there's the you know the perceived class gap there. But... And, and while the Brown Advisory Chair or the, while the National Hunt Chase did fall apart a wee bit, what he did and the way that he quickened and the his finishing sectional, it's he's 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 got that pace as well as stamina and obviously Cheltenham Cheltenham Festival and Cheltenham Festival winning form, um. So I put him on the Gold Cup radar as well. Bally Burton for the Champion Hurdle, if that's where he goes. You can get anybody to lay in on what I know about at this stage. Then that's probably a bit you should have because if he goes to the Champion Hurdle, he'd be an awful lot shorter than eleven point zero. Um, and like Matt, one horse who didn't run at Cheltenham, Marine Nacional, the forgotten Marine Nacional. I uh, think he's still a talented horse. Champ, he's 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 fifteen points here for the Champion Chase next season. All being well, if Barry Conlon gets him back to his best. Still think he's got that talent and that ability and that jumping ability. So yeah, I retain faith in him. Okay, enjoy that now. To be honest, uh, Marine Nacional, the last one there. Um, I've got three to add to the mix. Uh, answer to Cave. Um, we mentioned the Martin Pipe, a really good race in general, but I really think this year, watching the back a few times, the right four horses um, were there. And I think the horse that'll be best suited to three miles could perhaps be answer to Cave. Because of his age, I think they'll definitely go chasing straight away with him, given that he's eight already. But um, I do think they're, because given he's lightly raced, I think there's a bit of improvement to come. Uh, over three miles over fences so i'm really looking forward to seeing this horse a massive horse as well so one to keep an eye on even maybe not so brown advised you that is three trees but um maybe one to keep an eye on for the season if, if he isn't quite that top class the second one's william money who beat say to chance in a nav and bumper i was there that day pretty sick that might say to chance anti-post bet went up in smokes but i think he ended up being around the same sp price in the end for the champion bumper but um barry connell already has said this is the best bumper horse he has he's going to skip Challenge for Punches Sound. So if that horse uh, wins the Punches Sound, I can see him being half the price for the uh, Supreme that is um, going into summer. So that's currently 25s. And if you want one horse who I do think is is he's a favourite of, of this market currently, but I do think he's overpriced given if you do play a bit of William Mullins bingo for a second or two, I think Gaelic Warrior is almost a certainty to run in the Ryanair given the champion chase horses William Mullins has, given all the Gold Cup horses he'll have. I just think there's no way they won't run them in the Ryanair. So if that's your sort of price around sixes, so uh, around six point zero, sorry, five to one, um, I think he's well, or maybe six to one, sorry, whatever price he's at the top of the Ryanair market, I think he's one uh, for the shortlist. So we have a lot of horses there to throw at you for Channel 2025. We'll see how those horses progress throughout the season, and look, hopefully we'll be back next year for a second series of the Channel Trail. My thanks to Don and Matt. Don, you enjoyed it. Ah, yeah, look, it was great. I know there were the 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 there was the, the negativity about it and definitely on the wednesday you know the the the, the crowd before you you heard any figures the crowd did feel down it didn't feel like the the voluminous kind of fullness of a Cheltenham festival atmosphere and um, it got got a bit better later in the week but um no uh, overall yeah enjoyed it lots yeah matt we touched on this we don't see horses enough throughout the season because we'll get the quote-unquote battles at the Cheltenham festival we just need more of those battles at the very least to, to keep people interested in the sport i guess 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, brilliant. I really enjoyed the, being on the trail, go through that with you lads all season. And as you say, if we could just get a, some tweaks to the festival programme, I think next year will be even better. OK, yeah, Matt Toombs and Don McLean will be involved in our entry coverage there. Keep an eye on our social channels, your own podcast feed and your YouTube channel. And thanks, as always, to the listeners. We really appreciate your feedback, questions and contributions throughout the series. Tom Stanley and the gang will be back tomorrow morning, preview the weekend's racing, a mixed card as the flat is back. But uh, until we chat to you again, take care, enjoy the weekend and uh, we'll see you then. Bye bye.